between uh, ambulance problems, uh, right? So I want to set you up with another problem that we're going to work together. Whenever you're actually sitting there and observing something come come by, what can you easily, if all you have is you know a metronome or not, not a metronome, um, a tuner that measures the frequency, what can you easily measure? Frequency. Which frequency? The one that you observe. That prime. That's all you can get, right? So if here you are, right? If here you are, and uh, our our ambulance or our you know our police car that I tried to draw, and of course I always do a terrible job, comes by, right? All you hear as it's coming this way. All you can get is F prime. So what, let's make up a number and let's run with that right now. Um, let's say the F prime that you hear is 495 hertz, right? 495 hertz. You don't know, unless you have like some great in-depth knowledge about police cars, um, you know, and, and their in particular style, what was installed, all this other stuff, what frequency it's supposed to put out. But Whenever the car passes you, you get a, another F prime, right? Is this F prime going to be higher or lower? Lower. Lower. Right? Doppler shift. Now the frequency drops. It drops. So now I've got a frequency. I don't know. Let's just say 465 hertz. And that information right there, I want you to calculate the velocity of the police car. That's all I'm going to give you. And that information right there, I want you to calculate the velocity of the police car. How am I going to do this? System of equations. This will be a system of equations problem. You know the velocity of sound and air taking you about 340, right? You don't know two things. Velocity of the police car and the original frequency. Luckily, you will have two different equations, one for coming towards and one for going away. Okay, one for going coming towards and one for going away. Y'all know capable, capable of trying this before I do? And one yes? Just go All right. Uh, moving away. Uh, let's kind of set you up here. Coming towards F prime equals F, and then it's going to be V over V, and I know a plus or minus? Minus? This is a moving source here, and going away would be the opposite, F prime, F, V over V good, plus U. So that's, all right, give that a shot. Now, I'm trying to find U sub S, and that's my goal. Generally, whenever you substitute, now, now, this isn't always true. Sometimes it's easier to solve for the one you're not looking for and then plug that back in. But in general, you might as well solve directly for what you're looking for. Might as well. Okay. Um, so I'm going to solve for F in one and plug into that frequency on the other so that I can solve for new cell that's immediately. Glad I got that? Question, Kim? Because uh, it's the velocity of the source. Um, U we use for initial velocity lots of times, and since we already used V in the equation, we choose U. Um, and then the sub, uh, sub S standing for velocity of the source. I know. Mispronunciation. G sub S. And G sub F. What, whatever. Anyway, now, here we go. Uh, I'll, I'll do the right one to start out with. To get F by itself. For the record, Mitchum did not mean anything bad that he says. Because he is a very good friend of Kim. No. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, equals. This is 495. <laughs> now, whenever I'm dividing, I do the inverse, right? Dividing by a fraction means multiply by, by the inverse. So 340 minus u sub s divided by um, 340 is what f is. Everybody okay with that? I'm not going to distribute yet. 
here's why I'm not going to restrict it. I, I went ahead and plugged numbers in because I, th I think that may that makes y'all feel more comfortable. If I was working this on my own, I wouldn't plug numbers in yet either. Uh, but I'm definitely not going to distribute yet. Here's why. I'm hoping that whenever I take that and plug into the other, I get some things to cancel out. I don't know. I'm not sure. It might not. But I'm hoping. Okay, I'm hoping. So now I'm going to take this. I'm going to take this. Hey, it's it's math. If you normally in math, don't distribute until you have no other choice. That, that's just a rule of thumb. Okay, in case you haven't picked that up. Don't distribute, don't foil, don't do all that until you have no choice, you have to. Because lots of times in math problems, things cancel out. And the only way you see it cancels is if they haven't been foiled together, right? If they're still factor values, factors cancel. Yeah, let, let me come back. I kind of skipped over it. Um, so let, let's come back and let me talk about how I. Um, I mean, it would just be four nine five five. How I got this oh, right here. Now, um, this this right here oh, came okay. from this idea. I divide both sides by three forty, right? So um, I, I got f equals four ninety five over, right? Over three forty three forty minus u sub s. And whenever you divide by a fraction, right? you are doing the same thing as multiplying by the inverse. So take the inverse of this guy and multiply, and you get him, right? I get him. I'm not worrying about distributing this guy in. Um, if you need to see this, you know, as fraction divided by fraction, you know, that's 495 over 1, if you will, over 1. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come over here, and I'm going to shove him in. Now i got 4. 65 plugging him in here equals 495 495 times 340 minus u sub s over 340 times 340 over 340 plus u. So that's and it looks like I me mean, not factoring in is going to pay off and trying to simplify down. What cancels here? Yeah, three forties cancel. Everybody see that? They cancel out. One in the denominator, one in the numerator, they're being multiplied. So I get three forties out of there. That's nice. Okay? Um, so working another line down here, that's gonna give me four sixty five over four ninety five equals 340 minus u sub s over 340 plus u sub s. Yeah? Now, left hand side, that's just a decimal point, right? That's just a decimal point. On the right hand side, there's not really any more simplification I can do right there and try to get things to cancel out. Plus and minus, it's going to mess everything up. Okay? Um, Someone go ahead and give me this left-hand side from your calculator as a decimal. Let's just go ahead and let's get to decimals to fill up that screen. 0.94 approximately. Okay. Point 0.94 is, is there any other numbers for that? Just 0.94. 0.9393? Point nine three nine three. So let, let's keep it. Let's keep three sig figs. I recommend whenever you're doing this math, right, keep all sig figures until the very end. Um, if you're familiar with the store function in your calculator, use it. All right? Equals 340 minus u sub s over 340 plus u sub s. Next step, multiply by whatever's in the denominator. So 0 0.939 times 340 plus u sub s equals 340 minus use of s, right? Here I actually do want to distribute. Here I actually do want to distribute. Because then I'm going to be able to gather like terms and solve. Right? This is, this point in time, this is very, very simple algebra. Right? So the point 939 times 340, please. 319.26 approximately. 
plus 0.939 u sub s equals 340 minus u sub s. Grouping like terms right now, I'm going to come out with from the left hand side 1.939 u sub s equals 340 minus 319.96. Yeah. Now you subtract it by. Right. U sub s is going to equal whatever. 340 minus 319.26 over 1.9 through 9. What does the velocity of this please start to not be this? 10.6. Yeah. Right. 2.6 meters per second. Is that what everyone's coming out with? Mm -hmm. Yes. Story fun. 1.06. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know where that where that went off. <laughs> yeah, 10.6. All right. Now, um, that's just using out. That's just using out. Right. Uh, it doesn't take. Uh, Yes, this takes brain power. So let me pull back from what I was going to say. This takes brain power to do, but the main brain power that you got to use to not make you scared is making back seventh grade or eighth grade whenever you're learning this stuff, right? You know, maybe when you all do system of equations, nine to ten. You know, that's like the most recent thing in this. Otherwise, it's very, very basic algebra. Okay, yeah, but otherwise, it's very, very basic algebra, right? Um, so the main brain power you have to use here is just not breaking out. No. Let's actually use our brains and think about physics and make, <clears throat> and make this problem even easier. Let's come back up to the actual picture. Let's come back up to the actual picture here. Now, if this police car is going at constant velocity, like we have to assume, he shifts it, his frequency gets shifted up whenever he's going towards, and down whenever he's going away, the same amount. Does that make sense? <laughs> like if frequency is shifted up by 20 hertz whenever he's coming towards, whenever he's going away, frequency is going to be shifted down by 20 hertz. Yeah? Everyone get that? We can solve for f without doing anything here. The frequency of this police car is going to end up equaling whatever 495 minus, good, 465 divided by 2 is. That's half of the difference, or the average between them, right? Or you, you take the entire area, right, the entire range, and you cut it in half. He goes, uh, give me this number, please, for half. Half equals what? Um, and by the way, this isn't this isn't f yet. Excuse me. This is going to be what delta f. A change in the frequency. I apologize for that. A change in the frequency. What's the change in the frequency? Right. So 95 minus 65 is what? Delta f equals 15 hertz. Right. So now check this out. What's happening here is from some f, f equals, right? Whenever I'm coming this way, I whenever I'm coming towards, I add 15 hertz, right? I add 15 hertz. And whenever I'm going the other way, I subtract 15 hertz. Does this make sense? You didn't have to go with you know, the two subtract minus. You can just look at it, right? Just look at it. So what's f gonna end up being here? 480. But that's assuming that, that your two measurements are equal distance from the observer. The beauty behind this is distance doesn't have anything to do with it. The equation for Doppler effect only has to do with the velocity. Now, how far you are away will affect how loud it sounds, right? The amplitude. But the frequency shift. The frequency shift is only due to the velocity, which is almost because you're used to your brain 
so strongly focuses on how loud something is, right? It almost feels counterintuitive, okay? But it's just because your brain locks in the volume so much, the bottom pitch as much, okay? Um, it's only about the velocity. As long as you're going towards or away at constant velocity, this works. Now, if we got F right here, just by looking at the problem, this becomes unbelievably easy, right? I can take the before or the after. Let's pick the coming towards part. Let's pick the coming towards part, right? I've got F prime equals F times V over V minus U sub S. And this is just plug chuck. 495 equals 480 times 340 over 340 minus U sub S plug chuck. Does that make sense, everybody? Yeah? If you think physics-wise, this problem actually becomes he's okay, right? Instead of doing all that stuff in green, you just know that the frequency has to be 480, and then you plug chug it. Um, I looked at the two frequencies. I'll, I'll scroll up here in a second. Um, I looked at the two frequencies. Right, it was going 495. I heard 495 on the towards. I heard 465 on the away. I can assume that the Doppler shift is exactly the same going towards and away. Right, just one's going up and one goes down. Yeah. So in other words, what's perfectly in between those two frequencies? What's perfectly between those two frequencies? 480. 480 shifts it up by 15 hertz, right? Uh, but if you're going towards, if you're going towards 480 plus 15, gives you know, 495. And where I'm going away, 480 minus 15 gives you my 465. <coughs> it shifts the same on both sides. And that assumption there, that the velocity stays the same, so the shift has to be the same, so one's towards, one's away, one's plus, one's minus, means that I can just pick, if you will, since there's only two numbers, the average of the two, right? Exactly between them, that must be the actual frequency that's being emitted. So, like, constant velocity, you know, like, typically when we think about the Doppler effect, if you get a twist on your bias, it's kind of like a, like this in the pitch, you don't hear it really go up and down. But if we're going truly constant velocity, it would just be immediately go up and down. Yes. Um, it would be like it would be higher as it comes towards and lower as it goes away. The brain, let me pull back up this half button here. Stay the same. The pitch would stay the same. Let me pull this back up. Um, Okay, um, this is the one that, this is the little app with the police car coming by to try to simulate this, um, if it loads up for me. Um, the brain locks in so heavily, so, so heavily to volume that we almost assume that if the volume goes up, the pitch went up, right? You can even do that with your voice. Whenever you're doing it, you know, it's as it comes, and you, you do it whenever you talk about a truck coming by or something, right? You go, right? And then you know, the pitch actually kind of goes up and down, and it was volume. In reality, the volume gets louder as it gets closer, right? And the volume gets softer as it gets farther away. But that pitch right there, the pitch, Remains the same for an occasion the same happens. The only time it changes is that moment that it passes. The moment that it passes. Pitch. Um how it all right, pitch is a uh, is a human idea. It is a human idea of how high, if you will, and once again these are qualitative terms, right? How high a note sounds or how low a note sounds. So a piccolo has a very high pitch, right? All those notes are very, very high. And a tuba has a very, very low pitch. 
Okay. Um, and what it has to do with physics wise, what we like quantitative measurements, is frequency. The higher the frequency, the more high pitched we are about these other words, the sound is. Right? The lower the frequencies, the more low pitch they are, the more like the bass that it's a true. So the function has like this Doppler thing. Is it like what they're using like that Doppler radar they have? It's like exactly what it is. Exactly what it is. Exactly what it is. So, with that said, let's solve another type of problem. Coming with like now Doppler radar. Doppler radar uses radio waves, which is the form of light, right? The beam spectrum it uses radio waves, sends it out, right? Hits the cloud, bounces off the cloud, comes back at you. Okay. They're able to measure the speed of the clouds based upon how it's bouncing. Right? They're also able to get the shape of clouds based upon that also and then a bunch of other details. But never, never mind that for now. Um, first off, what I want to talk about with light. Whenever you get into light, the equations that you have really begin to break down. They really, really begin to break down. I mean, these little, you know, V over V plus or minus U sub S. I mean, goodness gracious. Now the mean is a 340 meters per second. It's three times 10 to the 8. Okay? It starts to break down. Instead, we're going to use a different equation. We're going to use delta F equals V over C times F. This is for light. Is it the right thing in a way? Okay. All right. V being the velocity of the object. What does C represent? Speed of light. C represents the speed of light. Are any of these equations in common? All of them. Uh, this one right here is, and the other two that we previously used. Okay. Um, the, the trick with the other two, right, was telling like whether you use plus or minus. This packet doesn't tell you. The trick with this one here is realize that, that is not F prime on the left hand side. That is delta F. That is the change in the frequency. Right? That is the change in the frequency. So that's F prime minus F, if you will. And this is not written in the packet. This is F prime minus F equals V over C times F. Now, your multiplication constant is that velocity divided by the speed of light. By the way, this only works also if you're going uh, much less than the speed of light. You need to be going much, much slower than the speed of light. Why is that, somebody? What happens when you get close to the speed of light? Frequency would be the same as your frequency. All right, it would there, but this equation actually breaks down. What breaks this equation down? Time changes. Something called relativity starts occurring. Specifically, special relativity starts occurring, where time slows down as you get faster, right? And distance shrinks as you get closer to the speed of light. And that's just weird. So the Doppler effect, now we actually have to throw in this idea of special relativity into these equations. Okay? Um, so by the way, physics has um, three main three main sections, and then there's a fourth that we haven't really conquered yet. Uh, three main sections. Classical Newtonian. That's what we're in right now. Classical Newtonian. Right? It's the physics of our physical world around here, which by the way is relatively large, human size, and relatively slow. Okay, relatively large and relatively slow, the timing of physics is what you're in. You have rel uh, general relativity. Special relativity is part of that. Okay? Uh, general relativity. It's the physics of the very, very fast. Approach the speed of light. And so you do all these sort of things again, just at insane speeds, and in which you've got to account for time slowing down and distance shrinking. Okay? That, you actually need to think Let's see how many of those problems. The third section is going to be what? Somebody? Quantum. The physics of the very small. Right? Physics of the very, very small. Okay? The fourth section is the section we haven't figured out yet. Relativistic quantum. Right? The very, very small going very, very fast. Okay? We just don't know. Right? The very, very right. Hey, we're still discovering a lot of stuff in quantum. We're not great at it yet. We're, we're pretty good. We're still not great at it. Okay? Um, so whenever you take all these particles, they do really weird things, like quantum physics says that a particle can go through an area that it's not supposed to go through somewhat magically. Uh, a physical re representation of that would be a particle can magically pop through the wall, whoop, out to the other side, even though it's not supposed to be able to. Right? 
there's a probability. Quantum's all about probabilities. There's a probability. Whoop, off to the other side it goes, right? Um, and that we're only happens. Yeah, yeah, we're not great at that either, but so there's um, a chance I could go through. There's a probability you could go through that wall. The only problem is you have a lot, a lot of particles. There's a lot, a lot of particles there, and the uh, more particles you have, the probability starts going down to zero. So there's zero probability. But anyway, um, keep doing it. The only way that you would be able to get, the only way that you can make probabilities work out is take a human-sized person and get them to go through the wall is to actually run at the wall an infinite number of times, right? If you do it an infinite number of times, you're able to cancel out the uh, the almost zero probability, next to zero probability, right? And if you, sometime in the matter of infinity, you will make it through the wall. Awesome, right? I want to do that. Let's start that. Uh, now, what are the odds? <laughs> Let's try. Uh, now, so... This is all Newtonian. This is all Newtonian. Do not be mistaken. Stars and our galaxy expand at relatively slow rates. Relatively slow rates. 5% the speed of light. 10% the speed of light. And go faster. If we start going faster, we're getting to 50-60% the speed of light. This is a Newtonian physics equation. It breaks down. It breaks down. Just because we're dealing with light and stars and all this other stuff doesn't mean that it doesn't break down here. Okay, this is not the relative. Um, let me work the problem for you, and, and then we'll talk about um, we'll talk about some. So let's have a star here. Um, let's have a star, and you know my stars. They're, they're going to be terrible. All right. So I got a star, hey, and I got draw a smiley face. I got hurt. No, 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 no. Miss Smiley faces on our stars. They're hot and burnt, so no, they're not so happy. But the sun um, not so happy. Let's say that the star is moving away from Earth, going directly away, with a velocity equal to 0.05 c. 0.05 c. What does that say? 0.05 c. What does that mean? Five percent speed of light. Perfect. 5% speed of light, which actually, by the way, leaving this in terms of C makes this equation oh so easy. Oh so easy. Okay. Uh, 0.5 C going away. Now, stars are mostly made of what, somebody? Yes. What type of hydrogen gas? Yes. Hydrogen gas. Now, think back to topic 7. Remember, every last thing, right, every last object on our Earth, each element has its own unique emission spectrum, right? Remember emission spectrums? Yes, I hope so. Uh, remember, it, it occurs when an excited electron drops down at energy level, and the very specific energy level it drops down, which is unique to each atom, right? a photon of that energy is emitted, giving us a very unique spectral line. Hydrogen happens to have a base wavelength that's emitted because it's emission, emission spectrum. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Hydrogen, H, emits 6.2. Five six times ten to the negative seven nanometers. Naturally. Oh no, we're not there yet. Hydrogen naturally emits six point five six times ten to the negative seven nanometers. In the lab, here on Earth, we do an experiment. That's what we get emission spectrum wise in nanometers. Oh, that should be in meters if we got time to send a negative second. Thank you. So, thank you, McKinley. That's time. Wavelength. Oh. Did I not say that? Lambda equals. Wavelength of hydrogen. Sorry about that, guys. It's that guy. Naturally. <laughs> So now, with this setup right here, with this setup, I want you to find for me what wavelength will you, what wavelength are you going to actually see here on Earth? We know hydrogen naturally, right? Whenever we do it at rest here, in case of new doctor effect, we'll at rest from the perspective of Earth. Mm -hmm. um, we know wavelength hydrogen emits. It's about 6.56 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. Okay. Um, that, that would be 656 nanometers. What 
wavelength, let's make that more of an M, what wavelength will you actually see from this star? What wavelength will you actually see from this star? Now, first off, we have addition. We don't want wavelength. What do we want? Frequency. We actually want frequency. So I need to get from wavelength to frequency. How do I do that? Yeah. V equals lambda f. That's a C equals my 6.56 times 10 to the negative 7 f. Right? Oh no! This is this is just for light, right? This is just for light. We're trying to get the frequency of the light. Okay, we're trying to get the frequency of the light. So this is going to be 3.0 times 10 to the 8 divided by 6.56 times 10 to the negative 7 equals f. What is this frequency? Frequency. Yes. Uh, when you go at point of C, is that like, you mean like a star is actually moving? Or yeah, the star is actually moving. The um, star is actually moving. We'll talk about why. Okay. What, which number is? Wavelength. Of yes. Yes. Um, we sign a hydrogen atom, it emits light. Right? It occurs with the electrons dropping out of the shell. So it's not a hydrogen atom, but it's light. And it, very, and it has a very unique emission spectrum. A very unique emission spectrum. We measure the wavelength of that light and we find the strongest and the one, one of, is it multiple so One of and the strongest wavelength light that we get out 656 nanometers, or 6.56 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. Um, that means that this thing's emitting a frequency of what? I got four point five seconds. Uh oh, complex. I mean this is just three point oh times seventy eight to my body. Yeah. Okay, so now let's take that number, right? And let's shove into our equation here. Let's shove into our equation of delta f equals f times by v over c, right? Um, solve for delta f equals my frequency of 4.57 times 10 to the 14th. Now, this is why it's very useful to leave things in terms of the speed of light. What is this? This is 0.05 C divided by C. C's cancel out. Right? That's why it's so useful to leave this in terms of the speed of light. Uh, that V there stands for the velocity of the star. Otherwise, we go over the velocity of light and how fast the wave is actually moving. Okay, so what is the. Delta F have to be? 2.287 times 10 to the 13 hertz. And remember, that is F prime minus F, right? Yes? I have an issue here. It's something that we just did. We found delta f. We're about to find f prime, but I need to stop and correct something here. Which direction is the star going? Away. Negative. Negative there, right? It has to be a negative there. Okay. Um, and we know what f is, right? Here, here's f over here, right? So what, what is what is F prime? The actual frequency of light that we're going to see. 4.344 times 10 to the 14th. 14th. Hertz, is that correct? Yeah. Cool. How do I get from, I'm looking for the wavelength that I'm going to see, how do I go from frequency to wavelength? 
the exact same way we got there the first time, right? This C equals lambda F, right? C equals lambda prime. Let's go ahead and get some primes in there. Times 4.344 tens of the 14th. What wavelength of light, lambda prime, do I actually see? 6.91 times 10 to the negative 7 meters, or 691 nanometers. Is that correct on our safe base? Ah, I got two safe figs right there, 0.05 safe. Right. So this becomes six, 690 nanometers. Which end of the spectrum was this shifted towards? The red or the blue? This was red shifted. This was red shifted. Red has a longer wavelength. Now I'm going to scroll up back to the original wavelength. The original wavelength was 656 nanometers. 656. And it was shifted to 690 nanometers. This is red shifted. I mean, things are going the way Yeah. Okay, so, okay, I understand why we used it, but why is, like, how, why did you put, like, H equals 6.56 and then you also put lambda equals? Um, H for hydrogen. Let me come back up and, and, and kind of correct notation as I was just writing. It's all, um, let's kind of correct some notation. The, the wavelength of sub hydrogen, right? The wavelength, the natural wavelength of hydrogen. Um, now, this means that it's redshift. Things that are going away from you, whenever you look at the light they emit, it is naturally going to be, does not work that, shifted more towards the red. Shifted more towards the red. Yep, and still, it's just a term we use. Redshift. Um, redshift. Uh, we actually use this idea right here to actively calculate how fast things are receding away from us in our universe. We know that stars are made of mostly hydrogen, right? Stars are, especially young stars that are burning at, at certain sizes, are made of mostly hydrogen. And I know here on Earth at rest, from our perspective, what the wavelength of hydrogen is supposed to be. Then I look through a telescope, right? Measure using a spectrograph, right? I, I measure the wavelength of hydrogen from that star, right? I do Doppler effect. I calculate the V, the velocity of the star as it goes away. Most things, in fact, almost everything in our universe is going away or towards or away. Our universe is expanding. How do we know that? Everything out there is redshifting. Almost everything out there is redshifting. All stars, all, all galaxies, almost everything is redshifting. It is running away from us. Everything, the visible light looks more red because it is more red. Right? Uh, and that also applies not just to the red part, but the, the blues become more towards the red. That means they're becoming more green, right? Um, the infrared actually gets longer wavelengths too. Everything gets shifted to longer wavelengths. But is, it, is it all moving in? How is it all moving away? It's like now. See what I'm saying? There are many theories here. Um, one theory, one theory states, and this is actually part of general. This is actually kind of spun in general relativity, that our universe lives in a lives on 4D space of the 3D space you see in time, being the fourth dimension. And if you will, let's reduce it down to where the 3D space we know exists as the surface of a sphere or a surface of a balloon. Okay, and the balloon is actually growing blowing upwards, okay? So as the balloon goes up, 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 right now everything is receding away from each other, like the skin of a balloon stretching. Okay. But if it's all going away from each other, then something they're going through each other. On a balloon, right? On a balloon, as you, you know blow it up. Now, I, I see what you're saying, but it's not It's not some things are collected in one side of the sphere and other things are spreading out, right? Um, on a balloon, 
any two points you mark, whenever you start blowing it up, those two points get farther away from each other. The trick isn't that the balloon's staying constant. The trick is that the balloon is actually expanding. And that is um, the current hell theory on um, Every, okay, I'm sure in one direction it's more rich than in another. It's weird going in one direction. Okay, we wouldn't be staying in the same spot. Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know the uh, math behind that, or the, exactly all the details behind that. I just know everything is redshifted. Um, even the ones in the everything. Every, yeah, everything, everywhere, it's all redshifted. Um, I'll bring a balloon and try to explain this. No, I don't um, balloon thing, but if, if we're going in one direction to start, the galaxy is kind of going the same direction, but they're moving faster than us. That's what I'm yes. saying. Yes. All right, so there is some, we're moving in there, then. okay, up there. But what we're finding is there is a constant underlying shift that's occurring just from the expansion of our universe, that on top of whatever else we want. Um, how are we not moving away from the sun? We will, we are, through this theory, we are. Um, but it's so slow when compared to the short distance. We're only able to tell when we're moving completely away from each other, right? Whenever it's the long distances that we're not having to move gravity. There's some other force driving the expansion in our universe. Gravity is losing right now. Okay? Um, current theory is that if the universe was able to exist forever and ever and ever and ever all men, um, that one of two things will happen. In this part is really a theory, this is just true. If the universe exists forever and ever and ever all men, um, either you're going to keep expanding forever more. And finally, things are going to get so far away from each other that there isn't enough heat. The energy of the universe gets spread out. I mean, think about it. We're not moving away from the sun much to grab these little points in. But if we continue to expand, all the galaxies start to get too far away from each other. And then all the solar systems finally start getting too far away from each other. And then planets inside solar systems start getting away from their stars, right? Gradually, slowly, which means there's not enough energy in the universe. And so the entire universe, you know, uh, way, way, way more now, um, goes into what's called a big freeze. Right? Everything freezes the temperature around the universe is somewhere around five Kelvin. Everywhere. All the energy of the universe spreads out uniformly. And it's so big, just gets us so far that we all freeze. Okay? Um, so either gravity loses and we continue to expand forever until we all freeze to death. Or gravity ends up catching up. Gravity ends up winning. Okay? Ends up catching up, slows the expansion down, right? Finally stops it. Then what happens? Brings it the other way into the big Crunch, right? And we all come together. One singularity, big black hole. Those are the those are the two theories. <laughs> okay, so if this theory is correct. 